Closing the love letter series on 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we reach the heart of chapter 1, of, not chapter 1, 1st John, as we reach towards the end. We've talked about some very important themes. Some of the themes that we've talked about is it challenges us to call sin, sin. Call it for what it is and not skirt around it. It's challenged us to be discerning in the spirit false teaching from biblical preaching, biblical teaching. Because we all know everybody thinks they are the right teacher. Everyone will cut and paste what they like, but God's word challenges us through this book to discern and use that, the spirit of God to help us and also live in the light of Jesus Christ. But today I want to conclude this series with a, a, a series of scripture that I think is more important as we enter into this season to celebrate Christmas that is essential for our time today. So why don't you open up with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7, and we're going to read to uh, verse 21. If you don't have your Bible, you can look it up on the screen or read on your phone with me. Let's read. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love and whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how, we, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not, is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he's given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. God bless the reading of his word. Why don't you bow your heads with me and let's pray to get our hearts ready and in posture for him. Father, less of me, all of you. God, we move ourselves aside to fully allow your spirit, you to come in and challenge us, change us, and move us into a, a position to be, to be your light, to be just like you. Open up our heart, mind, and soul to receive your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Back when I was a youth pastor, we went to this one-night trip in Rhode Island. And I asked one of the other pastors to come with me because I didn't want to have to drive the van with a whole bunch of teenagers. And I figured, hey, you can drive. I'll be your co-pilot, and we'll make this all great. So we're going. We're listening to the message. The kids are having a great time. And the speaker begins to talk about the love of God. And I'm thinking to myself, hypocritically, great, another message on the love of God. How many times do I have to hear it? And in that, mo in that moment, you will see how God humbled me. And as the, the pastor began, the speaker began to speak about the love of God, I looked to my left and the pastor that drove, he's around 50, he's around 50, 55, is in tears. And I wondered to myself, what is going on? And as I felt like in that moment, 
the Lord spoke, don't ever question my word or what I speak through his word. So I get in the van, I'm heading home, I'm like, man, God, I'm so sorry. And I ask him, hey, what's going on? And he says, all my life, I lived to receive the love from my physical father and never got it. And I preached on the love of God. I tell people God loves you. He's there for you. But I never truly took it in. And that night at a youth rally, he understood and not only experienced the love of God, he understood and encountered the love of God. You see, the love of God is more than just a plaque we put on the wall. You see, we all desire to be loved, to be a part of something bigger than us. We all long to want to be accepted, be loved, because that's how we feel we're contributing. But you see, the text today we are in explores the scope of God's love and the implications of it. And it's presented how that love was presented to us, how it was displayed in Jesus Christ, and how that love changes and transforms us. Now, if you look on the screen, this passage is broken up into three sections. Number one, the nature of God's love. Number two, abiding in God's love. And number three, perfected by God's love. Now, the word love or some form of it in this passage occurs multiple times in no less than 27 times in these sets of passages. So we know what John is trying to communicate us, communicate to us, and he's repeating it multiple times. So what type of love are we talking about? We know there's in the Greek there's three types of love, eros, phileo, and agape. But what John is stressing throughout is not an eros type of love. It is not philo, the brotherly or sisterly love. It is the true agape love that John is expressing of how Jesus died and the ultimate sacrifice of love, his truly love to love sinners like you and I. See, verse 8 shows us that God is love, not love is God. God is love. It's who he is. See, our world has a very shallow and selfish view of love. They love what benefits them. When God says, I sent my son to die for you to benefit all if you choose to repent and turn to me. That is a type of love that John is trying to bring forward. And then verse 9 and 10, he begins to explain how why God creates, why God cares, why Christ died, why we have the choice to accept his love, and why Christ died. Now, a popular theory or statement that has gone around, around for a long time, and I talked to Dr. Joe about this, and I said to him, why is it so hard to preach on the love of God? And he said to me, brother, you're not the only one that said that. You see, it, it blows my mind that God would send his one and only son to die for you and me. That doesn't make sense in my head. You see, other religions outside of Christianity say you have to work to receive love from the God you're chasing after. When Christianity, the gospel, the Bible says God sends his son to die for you because he loves you to save you from your sinful nature. To me, that boggles my mind. So I had, I had to think to myself, God, like, it's, it's not a, people say, well, you know, Pastor Tim, it's a soft gospel. It's a soft message. You know, God is love. You put it on a t-shirt. You put it as your Facebook status. You share it everywhere. It's great. But I beg to differ that it's not a soft gospel. It's not a soft word. You see, it's a powerful statement of God through his son, Jesus, 
that if you think the love of God is soft, hear me, then you believe the crucifixion of Jesus was soft and not a big deal. And that you just want to feel good. It never really had that. It really never then happened. And it's just a nice bedtime story to tell someone so then we can sleep good at night. And I refuse to make anything less than the cross of Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, the love of God is not soft. It is who he is, what he represents, what he brings to us as sinful beings. So let me tell you a story of my travel to Tillamook Cheese Factory in uh, Oregon, home of the squeaky cheese that squeaks when you choose, that you chew. Sorry, the New Yorkers and me coming out, my S's and everything sound the same, but I digress. So I'm at, I'm at the Tillamook Cheese Factory. I love cheese, especially cheese that squeaks. And I'm trying, I'm like, that's the only reason why I went. And the foodie in me was like, oh, I get to see cheese go everywhere, oh, but there's free food and it's free, it's for me. So... I go and I, I go through the tour. It's amazing. I'm sitting outside. It's Portland, Oregon weather. It's not like Fort Myers, but it was great. And I noticed there's this guy. He's staring at me. And in my head, I grew up in the city. And someone's staring at me from a distance. I'm like, okay, if we're going to throw down, let me get ready because I need to tighten my shoes, get my shoelaces ready because I'm going to get ready to throw down. And he comes over to me. And I want to tell you what exactly he said to me. On my wrist, I had an anchor bracelet. Because Hebrews has the verse, he's an anchor, firm and secure for my soul. It's one of my favorite verses. And he goes, your gospel is soft. Jesus never died on the cross for you. And I'm saying, oh, my Lanta, this is really happening right now in public. He goes, and now this is what he said, not what I said. He said, you know, your love, your, your gospel is just all what a bunch of hippies are doing. All you talk about is God is love, and then you act hypocritical. He then to proceeds, as God is my witness, take, takes his Coca-Cola in his cup and throws it on my face and says, you are just like the rest, and walks away. Now, there's two things I could have done. Reacted and tackled him to the ground and let him know what cement tastes like, how we do it in the, in the city. Or I can be mature and respond. So I'm praying underneath my breath. Pastor Dave, I couldn't let it out because I knew I was going to go to jail and I ain't got money for jail. And I said, I said, Lord, you better help me. Because I'm mad. <laughs> but God, you love me and my mess. Help me to love this man and his mess. So I go to the bathroom. I wipe myself off. Like, hey, it's okay. You know, God is good. Let's get more free cheese. Just let's go get more. And then I see in the corner, another corner, the same guy is staring at me. So at this point, I unbutton one button here. I'm like, all right, it's going down right now. He comes over, and I'm like, here we go. But listen to his response. I want to apologize to you. He says, I was in a church, and it hurt me. And every time I see Christians who represent Jesus, I hate them because they hurt me. He said he was bitter. And what he did was wrong, but he reminded himself that he is full of sin. And he came to a realization that he stopped blaming the church and realized it was people, sinful people, that hurt him. And in that very moment, he said, would you pray with me? Because I need to encounter the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, one more time. And in Portland, Oregon, at Tillamonk Cheese Factory, a soul was given back to Jesus Christ. Now understand me. It is nothing I did. It is all him. You see, let me remind you today that the love of God is vital because of moments like this. 
This man was hurt by people and covered it up. Many times we get hurt and we like to cover it up, act like nothing's wrong. But you have issues just like you and I until we fully give it over to Jesus. But I'm reminded of the verse that I wore on my bracelet that day, Hebrews 6, 19 through 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. We don't listen. Where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. How many of you are grateful that Jesus entered on our behalf to set us free and live in him? Praise God. Come on, you do better than that. Let me tell you. We give high praise to everybody else, but when it comes to Jesus, I thank him that I'm still alive. I thank him that he saved me. I'm thankful that he's still moving today in our lives, no matter what issues I face. But let me get back on track. Pardon me. Now, here's one side note. I have to talk about this. I'm begging you, as Christians, be very careful how we treat other people because we represent Jesus and the kingdom. We do not know their stories. We do not know what they've been through. As people, God, we cannot judge them based on what we see or don't see or what we understand and don't understand. The last time I checked in God's word, it says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. When with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm saying that to be honest. Because truth, love, tells the truth. You see, but getting us back. Now, let me warn you. We know God is good and his mercy endures forever. But understand, just because of the goodness of God, he cannot overlook, condone, or excuse sin as though it never happened. He loves us. But that does not make him morally lax. If we trust in Christ and we repent of our sins and turn to him, he already paid the penalty for our sin. We see in scripture, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been what? Healed. Or Romans 5.18, consequently... Just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Now many many scholars that you will read have had the discussion around the love of God, like I said, by calling it a difficult doctrine to grasp or understand. Now D.A. Carson, he wrote a book called A Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God, And I just want to go through quickly the five areas he talks about throughout the Bible about the love of God. The first area is the intra-Trinitarian love. He's basically saying the love of the Father for his Son and the love of Jesus for his Father. Number two, God's providential love over all that he has made. See, when God creates, it's the very best. He doesn't waste his time in making things. Now, the third one is is his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, that he sent to the world because of the fallen world of what happened in the garden. Number four, we have particular effective love that God has a special love for his people. And number five, we have provisional or conditional love based on obedience that we see throughout scripture. But remember, by remembering these categories, we do not put one over the other. God has laid out very equal how he expresses his love and we don't want to distort scripture because we favor one over the other. Now, how do we put this into action? How do we take this love that John is talking about? How do we move and position ourselves to understand what John at the very heart of 1 John is looking to bring together? And I would love for you to write these down so that you remember when times get difficult. Number one, 
The love of God saved us through Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The love of God saved us through Jesus Christ. So we have this opportunity this Christmas season to spread the love of Jesus. Grab one of these cards. Reach out to someone. It doesn't hurt to say, hey, will you go to our church? We're waiting for you to experience God. Because it's so interesting. I go out in Fort Myers and everybody wants me to sign a petition or something like that. I have no interest. But then it's hard. I, I, I want to praise this church because I went with like a father, Steve White, to Chicken Salad Chick. No idea what I was walking into. It was bomb. It was fantastic. And I go sit at one of the tables. And guess what was on the table? This card. So thank you, First Assembly, for being Jesus with feet on. Let us be the re let us be Jesus with skin on. See, we all think that we have to wait for Christmas and Easter. That's the only opportunity to evangelize. Every day we have a chance to be Jesus with skin on and show them and point them to the love of God. Now, what I'm about to share with you is something very personal. I just told my parents three and a half years ago. We told that so for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for you and me to set me to set us free. I can't remember if it was ninth or tenth grade, but I remember I was in my high school gym and I was molested by two guys in there. And I struggled with that for a long time. And I said it uh, in, I mean, I gotta remember. It was February of 2021. And I remember I told my mom and dad in the living room, I remember it's 10 o'clock at night, and their face just turned pale. And I said, why didn't you say anything? Because I said, I didn't know how to say it. My mother was molested by her uncle, so she understood. But when it's your firstborn, how do you respond? And I used to say to myself, why should I believe John 3, 16 and 17? If God really loved me, why would he have allowed that to happen to me? It's like there's, there's nights where I have nightmares of this happening over and over again. Can I be honest with you here? There are many people in our world that's been through this. And I was inspired when Pastor, I believe it was Pastor Terry, his wife shared, uh, Pastor Terry Wong shared about his wife and it, God challenged me to begin to share what had happened after. And I remember once a youth group, this is why I never wanted to go to youth group. Because I said, if these people are like this in church and they did this to me, why would I ever trust them? But it was in that moment on this very verse that my youth pastor preached and I encountered the love of God in that moment. And I said, he loved me so much that he picks me up from what I'm feeling to help me feel restored and secure in him. Yeah, it's a struggle. I wondered why God would ever let that happen to me. He loves me, but we suffer. But suffering is what it was develops us to be full in endurance. It develops our character. It helps us to receive the crown of life which he has promised to us. Number two. So the love, of, the love of God saved us through Jesus Christ. Number two, the love of God disciplines us. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. See, this is the part of love that's hard. Try growing up in a Hispanic household where slippers fly more than birds outside do. And you think 
they're not I'm, I, <laughs> I used to have, a, I was very bad as a kid. And I told my mom, you need to be quiet. I said another word, but I'm not going to say it in church on the altar because I don't want God to strike me. And um, she took a slipper and she tossed it. And let me tell you, it was like a curveball that followed me. It had a tracking beam right on my rear end. And bah, right there, she got me. But let me tell you something. I am thankful my parents disciplined me as a kid. I'm grateful that they did not go soft on me. Yeah, I got to behave. I got to behave. Okay. I am grateful that I had the love of God, to, that God loves me enough to discipline me, not to hurt me, but to make me a better person in him. But let me just say, discipline does not give you an excuse to be abusive. Because God is not abusive. So we understand that the love of God disciplines us. The love of God saved us through Jesus Christ. Number three, the love of God enables us to love those around you. 1 John 4, 19-21, the section we're in. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For who does not love their brother and sister who they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must love their brothers and sisters. I want you to do a favor for me. I want you to look around right now. If you're at home, if you're by yourself, look at your neighbor's house. Look around you. We are a family of Christ. We are a community. It's koinonia. As Pastor Russ has told us multiple times, we need community. But what's plaguing our world is loneliness. And it is literally labeled as an epidemic. See, before COVID-19, about half of the U.S. adults reported feeling lonely. Some surveys indicated that around 60% of people in the U.S. regularly on a daily basis, hear me, feel lonely. And this was before COVID. According to a, a poll, nearly one quarter of the world's population feels lonely. Younger people, less than 18, and there's a different set for 18 to 24, are feeling it even more with almost 8 out of 10 teenagers saying they feel lonely. Now, if that was before COVID, now I know this is Florida, things are different, but I was in Massachusetts, where if you breathed outside, you would have got locked up. It's different. So a loneliness began to capture us and stop us. Now, I can only imagine what the stats are now. See, people in this world are begging for a brother or sister to embrace them as a child of God. First as Jesus, God as our Father who loves us, and then a community to surround us. See, if you, reach, if you see someone who's alone, reach out to them. Buy them a meal. You pay, we'll pray. It's awesome. But be that brother or sister that says, you know what? I'm here for you because God was here for me and I want to be that hand and feet extended of the gospel to love you like Christ loved the church. See John 13, 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we go in above and beyond because that's what Jesus did on the cross for us. Now, number four, the love of God does not gossip against each other. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh Rather, serve one another humbly and love. See, the Bible repeatedly commands us to love one another. Treat others as we would want to be treated. It's the golden rule and love our neighbors as ourselves. We're blessed with the freedom of speech. 
But that, understand, God's plan for you does not include a haughty tongue. See, when we speak of others and our words are not motivated by love, we are being disobedient. Instead of tearing each, uh, each one of each other people down, instead of building them up, God calls us and encourages us to build each other up and encourage each other with Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as you're doing. See, while gossip may be a norm at the workplace, in the world, it is not a norm in the Bible. You didn't see Jesus going around gossiping about other people. He loved them despite their issues. And I'm begging us tonight to let not become like the world and have the mind of God to do his will. See, gossip is tempting to take part in, but it only hurts someone else and then it hurts you, whether you realize it or not. See, God doesn't, uh, God's plan for us is not to be filled with evil speech, but to be filled with his love and his truth and his word and his presence. You see, we were created in his image, so if we wouldn't speak it in heaven, why would we speak it on earth? Gossip does not help. It hurts. Spreading rumors about people that you don't know of. And many times I, when I worked in the hospital, people say people think they know me, but they haven't even, they didn't even know what I do. Spreading rumors does not help. It hurts. And I'm only sharing because this is God's word and it's so important today. Number five, and Ian can come up, please, brother. The love of God speaks the truth in love. Ephesians 4, 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, which is Christ. We are called to be mature believers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Thank God for the mature saints that have gone in front of us to be there when us younger ones don't know what to do. I thank God for my spiritual father, Steve White. Nearly, I think he's 70. The wisdom he speaks is like coming straight out of God's word. I'm grateful for those that have gone before me, ahead of me, to help teach us what it means through the hard times to be faithful believers in Jesus Christ by speaking the truth in love. See, as we grow, instead of being harsh when we tell the truth, because if we're telling truth to be harsh, we're not telling it in love. But when we tell the truth in love, a type of love that we see in Scripture that is described as patient, as kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Praise God. Now, I want, uh, if we can put that picture up. Long time ago, I came down with my parents uh, to Orlando the day they had, a couple days after the shooting in Orlando at Pulse Nightclub. Now, this is from Google. I had a picture, but I lost it. I remember Pastor Russ and I did this together back in the day. So this is not my picture. I said to my parents, I really need to go. I don't know why. And they said, okay. So it was literally a few days after it happened. About two days later, Senator Hillary Clinton was coming down to do the visit. We parked in the Dunkin' Donuts next to it. I don't know why I was there, but I needed to. So I'm out in the front. I just had come back from Portland, Oregon, and I had a Nike shirt on. And this guy asked me, oh, you love Nike? Are you from Portland? I said, no, brother. I'm from New York. I live in Massachusetts. 
I'm just down here vacationing. And he asked me, what, I, what do you do, Tim? Now, I'll be honest, sometimes when people ask me that back then, because there's a stigma with pastors, people think we're the worst people in the world. Now, this, this nightclub was a homosexual nightclub. So already their guard was up. And this is what he said to me after I told him. He said, you Christians are all the same. You hate us, and I want nothing to do with you. Now, this must be the theme of the night because I'm telling you, this guy then proceeds to spit in my face. How do you react to that? So I stand there, and when that happened, in tears, because I was feeling angry of what this guy just did. But my heart broke for him. And all I could do was stand at the side and I prayed. And I started praying. I said, God, I apologize for anything I've done to ever hurt anyone. But this guy comes over a few minutes later in tears and he says, I'm sorry. I know the lifestyle I'm living is wrong. And I take my frustration out on you because all I feel is feeling wrong and all I feel is angry and despair and I feel like I'm in a dark cloud and I don't know who else to reach to and every time I've reached out to a Christian they turn me away and put me down and I said sir you reach out to Jesus acknowledge what your sin is wrong and, and you repent and turn your life around he'll save you and change your life forever and in that moment I'm telling you, the theme as I was writing this sermon, praying, God, give me the words. This man in front of a crowd of 300 people in the front of Post nightclub gave his life to Jesus because he realized he needed him more than anything. That's the love of God. We're not here to prove people wrong. We're here to point them to Jesus and let Jesus do the work through his word, through his spirit, through the love of God that changes and transforms. At that moment, truth in love was spoken and received. Look, I'm not perfect. I've made many mistakes, but I stand here humbly tonight because it was the love of God that sustained me through one of my hardest times in my life. Because he loved me like a father, when I don't have a father that I can call anymore because he's made it home to heaven, I call upon him to tell me, God, I need your help. I need your son. It is hard to be a man in today's age when you don't have your father with you. And I say, God, put the people around me to help me experience it. Not just experience, I'm tired of these experiences. They come and they go and we move on and we never remember them. I want an encounter with the love of God this evening, no matter how messed up you are, no matter how fearful you are, because if you're living in fear, it is not love. Tonight, I don't know where you are, but hear me. God loves you. He's proud of you. He's thankful for you because he sent his son to die for you and I to have freedom in him. I close with this. And we're, uh, Brother Ian's going to go into a song and pastor's going to come pray us out. But hear me online and hear the world around us is getting louder Listening to the world around us, we can't, we can't help but to understand the volume of negativity is rising up louder and louder. Anti-Bible, anti-Jesus, anti-everything the Bible represents is being broadcasted louder and louder. We listen to the news, you hear louder voices. You hear stronger opinions. You hear harsher disagreements. If you scroll through social media, you can't scroll through one post without seeing an argument. But here's the thing, everyone wants to be heard. 
And collectively, we seem to be going to greater and greater lengths, even if it means uh, pushing away what the Bible has called us to do because it fits our agenda. But as we, what we listen to gets amplified in our mind. But let me tell you, it's a vicious cycle, but it's one Jesus has already overcome. You see, how did Jesus handle this? He responded to this ever-increasing volume of hate that was coming towards him, lies that were being spoken to by quiet and deliberate acts of love. I quote Pastor Russ, people will not remember what you said of them, but what you've done to show them love of Jesus Christ in their life and through God's word and through examples, that's what people remember. Everywhere Jesus went, he was met with opinions. He was met with trap questions. He, he had direct hatred handed to him, directed at him. People were constantly trying to silence him, discredit him, hijack his platform to amplify their voice instead of his. I wonder, it had to be infuriating, but Jesus did not let it get to him. He showed them love. And how do we know if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? By your fruit. I'll speak louder than anything. See, Jesus used his voice, but he didn't need to shout. He not only stayed on the path of preaching patience, selflessness, and love, but more importantly, he demonstrated them. He responded to the ever-increasing volume of hate with, again, like I said, acts of love. Not to gain the center stage, but to honor his Father. And the result is evident that in the fact that over 2,000 years later, love came down and rescued us, and his body and his blood is ringing louder than it has ever before, and we lean into that tonight. So tonight I'm just here to remind you of personal examples in my life. Nothing I did, did anything. It was, it was Jesus. It's not about me. It's all about him. John 3.30, I must decrease. He must increase. And when we begin to stop trying to be the loudest in the room and let the fruit of our life show that we are true Bible-believing Christians, Though the world may be loud, the cross rings louder. Why don't you stand with me as we begin to close tonight before pastor comes, prays us out. We'll love for you to join us this weekend at church as we close our Life Versus series and hear from our pastor. Let's be the love of Jesus this season. As we sing, I just want to challenge you. Raise your hands. Pray for those that you are praying for that desperately need Jesus. Challenge yourself to not let this be another message of the love of God, but you truly encountered it tonight and understand how important the love of God is. So Ian, go ahead and take us away, brother. Hey there, family. I'm Pastor Kerry right here at First Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service today. I just wanna encourage you on your journey with the Lord, and I wanna take some time right now and pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single person that's watching. God, I pray a blessing over them. I thank you for your presence in and through their lives. And I, God, I pray over the word that has been spoken, Lord, that it would not return void and not return empty to them. I pray a blessing upon their week and in everything that they have going on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about today's service, please feel free and visit our website at famfm.com. We also have an app, so feel free and download that as well and visit our social media pages for more updates on what's going on here at First Assembly. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to be with you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.